Welcome to College Algebra, Chapter 2, Section 7, where we are going to talk about inverse functions. Inver inverse functions are interesting because they are sort of the vehicle that you use to make the return trip. And what I mean by that is, for example, I take I-75 north to go from home to work, and the inverse function that takes me from work back to home is taking I-75 south. I could implement those in reverse order, and if I took I-75 south and then north again, I would end up at work forever. I don't wanna do that. I like my first example better. I leave home, I go north, I work, I go south, I'm back home again, I like that. Uh, and what we're seeing in this kind of blue box is the function description of that. So if I take f of g of x and I put home into that function, what happens is I go north with the inner function and then I go south with the outer function and I end up at home again. On the next line, if I build my function sort of inside out, if I work with g of f of x, what that's saying is that I leave home, I go south, and then I go north again. And what happens is I end up at home again. I love that, love coming home. So if g of f of x, or if f and g rather cancel each other out, and g and f also cancel each other out, leaving you with your input value, no matter how you build the composite function, then f and g must be inverse functions. And it's helpful to know how to make that return trip, how to get home. And there's a way, there's a method that we can use when we're given the initial function, the outbound function, the one that takes us to work. There's a method that we can use in order to find the root home. And I'll demonstrate that for you here. What was on the uh, on these previous slides was sort of a generic version of this process, but let me illustrate for you the process with an actual function. So here we have f of x equaling x to the third minus one, and we're gonna find f inverse. Let's make this a little larger, see if we can move this over. That'll work. The first thing I'm going to do is replace f of x with y equals. It's just a little easier to write. So my first step is sort of uh, use y equals instead. So I've rewritten my function using y equals. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually take my x and y values, my variables, and swap them. So I'll write swap x and y. Now, before I started writing these notes, I didn't read any of the stuff on the previous page. So the way that I'm phrasing this might be a little bit different than the way that it was phrased if you read the text on that previous slide, which is good because how I'm phrasing it m might not resonate as well with you as how it was written out on the previous slide. And if that's the case, use the way that it was written out. Or if what I'm articulating works for you, use the way that I'm presenting it. I want you to use the, the method and the language and so on that works most consistently for you. So I call it swapping x and y, so let's do that. I'm gonna write this as x equals y to the third minus one. And you can see that they literally just traded places. Everything else remains where it was. And now I'm going to perform a series of steps that have a particular goal in mind, and the goal is to solve for y. I want to get y all alone on the right-hand side of the equation. So I'm gonna add one to both sides. And then in order to get rid of the cube, or the exponent of three on the y, I'm going to take the cube root of both sides. So it looks like a square root symbol, but I've got a little index of three in there. So that's the cube root. 
So the cube root of the left-hand side equals, and the cube and the cube root cancel each other out, leaving us with equals y. And now that I've got my y isolated, I'm going to replace it with this notation. My handwriting with this digital pen is not great. It's not great anyway. Uh, but that says it looks like f to the negative first power. And that is supposed to be a little negative one up there, but when we read it, we say f inverse of x. Originally, we, were, we said, <clears throat> Where is it? There it is. That says f of x. And now down here, this says f inverse of x. So when we make that replacement, the cube root of x plus 1 is f inverse. It's just terrible. f inverse, there we go, of x. So that would be your final answer. You'd probably only be typing in the left-hand side of that statement. But that's f inverse. And we used y equals instead, and then we swapped x and y. And then really it was only these two steps that we needed to do in order to solve for y. And if you don't want to write solve for y, you want to write get y all alone write that instead. If you want to write isolate y, write that instead. Whatever resonates best with you, especially for later when you're going through and reviewing your notes. But that's the process of finding an inverse function. The the first step of using y instead of function notation that's going to happen every time. Swapping x and y, that's going to happen every time. The process of solving for y might look different. These individual steps that happen in here are going to be different from problem to problem. But this part of the process, generally speaking, solving for y, that's going to be the same, and it will happen third every time you do this. And then finally, your very last step, replacing y with f inverse, that's gonna happen every time. So it looks like a four step process. So as you're reviewing this, and you're working different problems, realize that these four steps are gonna get applied to each problem, but this portion of the process in here is gonna look a little different from problem to problem. All right, let's see what else we've got. Ah, uh, the horizontal line test. Now you're familiar with the vertical line test. The vertical line test is what we use to test to see if the graph that we're looking at is the graph of a function. And a function, as you might recall, by definition is a relation that doesn't have any repeated x values. All right, so if we looked at it as a list of ordered pairs, you don't wanna see that any x values used more than once. The horizontal line test is then checking to see, are we using any y values more than once? For example, if I had a parabola, well, this thing fails the horizontal line test big time. Look at this. If I draw a horizontal line right here, both of these points have the same y value. Fail, big time because this line fails, here it fails, here it fails, everywhere it fails, fails. So a parabola, while it's a function, because it passes the vertical line test, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. But what's the horizontal line test testing for? If your graph passes the horizontal line test, then the inverse of that graph will be a function. So a parabola is already a function. The question is, does this function have an inverse that's a function? 
And because this parabola fails the horizontal line test, the answer is no. If we encounter a graph that not only passes the vertical line test, but it also passes the horizontal line test, it has to pass both, then we say that that function is a one-to-one -one function. That doesn't happen all that often, it's pretty unique. So here's an example where we're being asked to determine which graphs represent functions that have inverse functions. A graph can have an inverse without that inverse being a function, but we want a graph to have an inverse that's also a function. Now every one of these graphs on the screen right now passes the vertical line test, so these are already all functions. However, let's try the vertical line test on this, or the horizontal line test on this first graph. Oof, fail. Our horizontal line passes through our graph at more than one point, therefore, while this is a function, it does not have an inverse that's a function. What about number two? So this one's, that one's a no. Number two, is it a function? Does it pass the vertical line test? It does. What about the horizontal line test? Can you draw a horizontal line through this graph that crosses the graph at more than one point? I don't think so. This horizontal line only crosses at one point. This horizontal line only crosses at this point. Even the x-axis is only crossing the graph at one point, crosses at one point. Looks good. This graph does pass the horizontal line test, and therefore it has an inverse that is a function. Since this function has an inverse that's a function, that means that this bad boy is a one-to-one -one function. Not good. It's a function, but its inverse will not be a function. I can tell that because I can draw a line, a horizontal line, that crosses this graph at more than one point. So it fails the horizontal line test. Therefore, its inverse would not be a function. This graph is the graph of a function because it passes the vertical line test. Crosses only at one point, crosses only at one point, crosses only at one point. This graph passes the horizontal line test. Therefore, this graph has an inverse that's also a function. So it looks like two and four are the graphs of functions that also have inverses that are functions. Now visually, graphically, we've been talking a lot about graphs here, you should know that the graph of a function and the graph of its inverse function are mirror images of each other or reflections of each other over the line y equals x. And you can see here that these two graphs are reflections of each other over this dashed line y equals x. Also, sort of a key feature there is how would you go about reflecting a graph over the line y equals x? You pick a whole bunch of points on your initial graph, or as many as necessary, and then you take their x and y coordinates and have them, and have them trade places. You'll notice that on the graph of f, the coordinates of this point are a comma b. And when you reflect that point over the line y equals x, you end up at a point on the inverse function that has coordinates b comma a. So the domain and the range are trading places. And that's literally what's happening when you're working with a one-to-one -one function. The function and the inverse function have domains and ranges that have been 
swapped. I'm using the word swap very intentionally because in order to find the inverse function, one of the first steps that we took, it was step number two was swap x and y. And we did that because to create an inverse from a function, all of the x values become y values and all the y values become x values. In other words, the domain and the range trade places. So that is just one little concept. It's actually kind of a big concept. It's an important one. This thing pops up for sure. Anytime you're taking the square root of a square or the cube root of a cube, if you've worked with any trigonometry, the sine and the inverse sine function, anytime that two things cancel each other out, leaving you with just that variable, you're working with inverse functions. So you've actually had exposure to this and didn't even realize it, but Here's a little bit more information for you about inverse functions, and please make sure that you get good at the process of creating an inverse function when you're given a function. So we did an example of that. Given f of x, find f inverse. You need to be good at that. I'd be willing to bet there's going to be a test question about that. All right, enough hints. Uh, thanks so much for having a look at these with me, and I will see you in, where are we going next? Let's go to 2.8 next. See you there.